flourishing life, I think, is living a life that follows God's will, but in a way that um, is willing and is content with the direction that it's in. Flourishing is where you're going strong or making a difference in the place in which you're planted. When we're growing in Jesus, and also growing in our relationships with other people. Being content and secure in who you are. Uh, in other words, not needing to spend your whole life searching for your life's purpose. When am I flourishing? When I'm serving. I get enormous satisfaction out of helping people, doing things for them, using the gift that God has given me. Flourishing is where you continue to grow no matter what's happening in your life. As you get older, you're either shrinking or you're growing. Being the best that we can, even though we're not perfect. Having happy and fulfilling relationships. To me, living a flourishing life means that I'm living a life um, where I invest my heart and soul and time into things that I will look back on and be happy that I did and not regret. When we're living the way God intended us to live. G'day everybody, my name is Nathan Sandon. I'm the Senior Minister of Oste Thrill Anglican Church. And I'm just really excited to be able to invite you to join with us as we explore this topic of human flourishing over the next coming weeks and months. How would you answer this question of what does it mean to flourish? My name is Jane and this is David and we come to the 9am service if we haven't met you yet and by coming to the 9am service I mean we normally watch you in our lounge rooms <laughs> and I confess sometimes I might make a cake while I'm doing that which is illegal. Um, contentment, fascinating thought and that's today's um, sermon topic. Um, as we're looking at human flourishing, we're in, in the middle of, of a particular series looking at what does it mean to flourish as a Christian, as a human being who loves Jesus? And so... Um, yes, yeah. I've been meaning to ask you. Oh. <laughs> yes? What have you been meaning to ask me? <laughs> what does contentment look like for you personally? Yeah, I, I find that a really interesting question, so I'll zoom right around the outside of it. Um, <laughs> um, I think that um, because contentment for me is something that's quite inner and, and something that is not necessarily, um, though can be obviously, impacted by external circumstances. It's quite an interesting state, isn't it, contentment? And, I mean, it's quite elusive for us all. But for me, I suppose if you saw me and I was, I don't know what it looks like, but if I looked like I was kind of at peace and not, it's funny, I can only think about it, about what it's not and not really sort of striving or, or driven or that sort of um, what, whatever that looks like. And it doesn't necessarily look like I'm just sort of lying on the lounge, but it just... It's, it's that I'm not really anxious, I suppose. There's a, yeah, so, so when I'm content, it's, more, it's about an inner state, I think, of peace or something and, and security, knowing who I am in God. Anyway, that was a bit round the circle, wasn't it? Right. It's always like that. All right. <laughs> okay. So, David, what does discontentment look like to you? Well, that's probably... Uh, uh, yes, well, definitely got me. So, I mean, over the last 18 months, you've probably seen me discontent. Uh, So I guess, you know, I've been very affected by COVID and one of the things I do every night is go to sleep and when I wake up, my hands. I clench tight and I guess that's, um, I guess that's the inner me trying to make it happen, which I guess is the opposite to 
to trusting in God's goodness, which I'm very aware of. Um, I guess COVID has um, made me realise there's a part of me that doesn't, that's not doing as well as I as I thought it was. And so I, I guess I have dis- discovered a side where I've actually predominantly trust in myself rather than God. So that's been a bit of a surprise. So um, that's what discontentment <laughs> uh, looks like. You got me. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, he actually wanted me to ask him that question. <laughs> um, okay. So I just taking taking that on board and, I don't know, hearing other people obviously um, relating to what you're saying there, David. Um, I'm just thinking um, Nathan drew my attention this week to a program called Press On, which the Condies um, uh, are offering to the church communities. Uh, it's a program which helps us to build our sense of well-being um, within a Christian context. And I don't know, I, I think it, it might be of interest to us. Uh, this might be a way that you or a group might decide to focus on, well, well what is inner peace and what have I discovered about myself in COVID and in what way might I be able to sit with that? And this program, Press On, might be one of those ways. Um, the Bible reading um, this morning comes from Philippians uh, chapter 4 uh, and is from verses, verse 4 to 12. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you have had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need For I have learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. This is the word of the Lord. One of the things I've really enjoyed about this series is as we've been going through each week that um, each of the topics start to kind of interconnect, you might have noticed. So last week we looked at the idea of persevering, the idea of um, just being able to endure, to be resilient. That was last week and I think it kind of actually neatly connects a little bit to what we're looking at today, which is contentment. But um, as we do that, how about I lead us in a time of prayer and then we'll be looking more deeply at this passage in Philippians. Please join with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do so thank you for your precious word to us. We thank you that it's like that rain that falls outside, that you remind us in the scriptures that it's like that water that nourishes the earth and that it doesn't return back to the heavens without fulfilling the purpose for which it is sent. So Lord, we pray for us this morning that as we read your word, as we meditate upon it, Lord, we do pray that it would have its purpose in us, that it would reform us, it would shape us it would change us 
But we pray this by the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Contentment. What exactly is contentment? And how would you define the term? David and Jane has already helpfully started us to think about this idea or this question of what is contentment. I define it as something like being satisfied or even happy with whatever it is that you have. So I think that word satisfaction is a key kind of idea connected to contentment. And one of the things that we found, particularly with this issue of contentment and the COVID pandemic, is the struggle that a lot of people have had with mental health and this issue of contentment in recent years. The number of phone calls that are being made to different helping organisations beyond blue, they report like an increase of over 100% of phone calls to beyond blue. Another place to call is Lifeline. They've also reported a dramatic increase in phone calls to Lifeline. And of course, the rates of suicide amongst young men in particular has been skyrocketing. And if you are a local like me, uh, as we church together in the northern Illawarra, how's that ominous sound of those sirens that you hear as they're heading north? And again, just even recently over the last few months, the number of times you hear the siren and so often it's actually an emergency response crew that are heading towards that ocean bridge to the north of us. Friends, our current experience of contentment is one which is a great struggle. Jane helpfully said it's an elusive thing. And there's a book that I've been particularly uh, reading and uh, engaging with, which is Why Are We Restless? Modern Quest for Contentment. And let me read to you this quote. We live in an age of unprecedented prosperity, yet everywhere we see signs that our pursuit of happiness has proven fruitless. We're dissatisfied and we seek change for the sake of change, even if it means undermining the foundations of our common life. Friends, the main idea that this book engages with is particularly this idea. It's a wonderful title. It's a modern quest for contentment. And what the authors are sort of pointing to, they point to a lot of the human philosophers, particularly of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance period and humanism. And I'll be coming back to um, some of the things that they've been sharing throughout this book. But what they're saying is it's weird what's happening because we've never been more prosperous. Our technological advancement has never been what it is today. We've never been as wealthy today as a society as now. There's all these reasons, medical science, all of these things that should be answering or should be kind of producing a contentment, actually the results are very much the opposite. And why is this happening? What is going on as a society and why as a society are we so restless? You might like to think about that kind of question of why. I think one of the big culprits when it comes to this issue is the desire always to want more and more and the advertisers, and they say to us, we can't have that fulfilment or contentment until we sort of meet up with a certain image of what it means to be satisfied. But again, just as we think about this idea of contentment this morning, I'd just like to invite you to pause and stop at the moment this issue of contentment and how you're going at this stage and at this moment. What I'd like to do is share with you top 10 tips to discover the rare jewel of Christian contentment. That's the title of my sermon this morning. And it kind of comes, the title comes from this book, which is a Christian book, and it comes from the Puritans. And it's a book that I discovered many years ago, which is wonderful. And it's by Jeremiah, Jeremiah Burroughs. But the book is The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, a wonderful book, which I, again, I urge you or encourage you to engage with, particularly if it's one of those areas that you're interested in when it comes to contentment. The top 10 tips I'll be drawing from primarily Philippians chapter four, but also from Psalm 131. And so I'm gonna go pretty fast. So you're gonna to have to kind of just keep up with me. Tip one and two, Christian contentment is a rare and precious jewel. It's elusive. It is something that is precious. It's something that we don't all necessarily have. But the second tip which is connected to it is hopefully an encouragement, which is that it is something that is to be learned. Let me show you from Philippians chapter 4. For I've learned, Paul writes, to be content. There's a, I've learned to be content. Whatever the circumstances, I know 
what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty and I have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation. There's a secret to it. There's that elusiveness. Again, it's this treasure that we kind of long for or consider. Our Lord Jesus, when he was on this earth and as he walked around, he told many parables. One of the parables that Jesus said is the parable that the kingdom of God is like a precious pearl or a precious treasure. The idea, Jesus says, if you find this precious treasure in the field, the man goes back and he sells everything he has with joy to come back to that precious treasure. It's this idea that we all seek it, we all want it, we desire it and we search for it, but it is elusive and it's sometimes hard to have. But it's contentment is something also to be learned is the second piece. Paul says this twice in Philippians, I've learned this thing. And again, the encouragement I think is perhaps, especially if you're like me, perhaps you're struggling with contentment. Perhaps you don't have it. And it may not be something that comes naturally to all of us. But the encouraging thing is from the scriptures is that it's something to be learned, that we can develop, that we can grow in this area of contentment. Another encouragement to you is that not just at Philippians 4, but also at Psalm 131, the psalmist writes, I have calmed and I have quieted myself, and I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. That's what the psalmist writes about this issue of contentment. And again, the idea is a weaned child is a baby that initially is breastfed, and then as it gets older, it's now weaned, and so it's a little bit more self-reliant, it's a little bit more independent, it's still close to the mother, but it's now weaned. But the idea here that Psalmist picks up, which Paul picks up in Philippians, is this sense that it's something that comes with maturity. And as we grow, and as we become bigger, we're able to learn this. My friends, it connects to tip number three as well, where he says, I have calmed and I have quieted myself. Tip three, Christian contentment comes from calming and quieting. Think about all the noise in our society and in your life. Just think about all the voices that speak to us about this issue of contentment and about the rich life and about the true life. Think about how much time do we spend on our screens or our devices. This idea that to, to, to reach a certain point of contentment, sometimes we need just to check out of all those other things in order for a period of time of reflection and a time of quietness and calmness. But you might notice that the psalmist says, I made myself quiet. Again, that's part of that maturity, the discipline, in order to be able to switch things off, in order to then be able to focus as well and be quiet. Friends, on the screen before you, I think is one of the big culprits when it comes to my discontentment, and it's the social media. And this is what happens on social media. That's life in the top box, and it's drab, and it's ordinary, and we sit there on our phones and we spend lots of time. How many hours or minutes do we spend looking at our screens? And what we have the depiction of life is below, which is a wonderful rainbow, and there's a little unicorn, and there's sparkly lights, and everything is awesome. But it's not real. And it's what is presented to us over and over and over again. So social media has this dramatic impact on this issue of contentment. One of the things that in this area of contentment as well, I just share with you as we think about this issue of quietening ourselves. Again, when it comes to social media, you may have seen this documentary on Netflix, which is The Social Dilemma, which also speaks to us of the way in which our social media usage is impacting this area of mental health and our contentment. And it's a fascinating uh, documentary, and if you haven't seen it, I'd recommend it to you. One of the things it kind of alludes to is this little picture here. This is what's happening whenever we're looking at social media. And the brown bit is just us grounded. That's normal life. And then as we engage with our phones and as we start to share our lives, most of us only share the good stuff, the exciting stuff, the happy stuff. But you'll see that the crafted image, if you like, is just, it's just the good. And so what we do is we all look at each other's lives and there's a gap. And that gap creates the envy or the inadequacy, the frustrations and the disappointments. Why isn't my life looking like that person's life? How is it that I'm missing out on what they have? 
Friends, this issue of all the voices, the ability to calm oneself, to quiet oneself in the midst of all the noise is what the psalmist speaks about. Tip number three when it comes to Christian contentment. Tip number four of Christian contentment stems from the nearness to God. The writer of Philippians chapter four, he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all for the Lord is near. Friends, as Christians, we're able to say this idea that God is close to us. And it's a wonderful gift and a blessing when it comes to contentment. James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and God will draw near to you, is the promise of scriptures. Friends, I was sharing that the, the book that I've been reading, which is like a humanist answer to this question or the quest for contentment. One of the big ideas that's contained in this book is when it comes to contentment, particularly the Renaissance philosophers and the enlightened philosophers of our age, which we kind of now live in the shadow of, they've searched for this idea of contentment, but contentment in a sense without God. And their answer largely is that life is found in the discovery of self. If there is no God, life and contentment, satisfaction is found in the self, is the summary of what the modern humanist philosophers speak of. Humanist philosophers such as Rousseau, Pascal, Voltaire, they argued and they hold forth that the meaning of life, contentment, is found in yourself, that is now found inwardly as you discover who you are. And the idea is what they're saying is for contentment to be found, you need to draw near to yourself. But as Christians, we say, no, 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 no. it's about drawing close to God. That is where true contentment is found. And as Christians, we can especially rejoice in the, the saviour of our Lord Jesus Christ, who at Christmas time, we remember one of his names is Emmanuel, God with us. That we can speak confidently that God is near us, not just as a philosophical concept and as an idea that's a neat idea, but that actually because God, out of his initiative, has sent his son into this world to show us that God is with us. Emmanuel. And our contentment is directly connected to drawing near to God. That is where contentment is found, not looking inwardly and only to ourselves, but actually looking and drawing close to God. And it's connected to this idea. Tip four kind of connects to a few other tips. Tip five of Christian contentment is the gift of prayer. Look with me again at Philippians chapter four. For the Lord is near. And so do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Friends, there's this wonderful promise in Scripture that as we draw near to God, we have a gift, and that gift is the gift of prayer, that God cares about our burdens. And the interesting thing about this particular verse is it says, don't be anxious about anything. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to be anxious, or some people feel guilty when we talk about this topic, and I'm like, oh, I've got a lot of anxiety. And am I being sinful if I'm anxious? And the answer is, no, you're not. Because it's saying, as that anxiety rises up in you, what do you do with that anxiety is you bring it to God in prayer and you give it over to him and you share that burden with him. And the scriptures tell us that he will help carry that burden. Again, friends, it's a wonderful element of Christian contentment that we can take everything to God in prayer. We can lay our burdens down at the foot of the cross. Connected to this idea of the gift of prayer as well is tip number six, is the fostering of thankfulness. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Friends, one of the great challenges, if you're an atheist, if you don't yet believe in this stuff, when things are good in your life, who do you thank? Maybe you thank yourself. I think that's what um, the great 20th century theologian Snoop Dogg does, is he says, I give thanks to myself. And who do you give thanks to when things are going well? We as Christians, we can thank someone other than ourselves. We can thank God 
for those things that are in our lives. One of the great exercises is this discipline or this sense of fostering thankfulness and how do we do this in our life? One of the ways we do it in our families at the dinner table, particularly there's a lot of grumbling and everyone's really cranky and everyone's yelling and we stop and then we go around. Everybody has to just say one thing, just one thing that you are thankful for today. And friends, as a Christian, we always at least have one thing, which is at least we've got God and at least God is with us and at least God loves us and at least God cares for us. If that's all we've got to be thankful for, then we still have that to be thankful for. But our God is a good God, he's a powerful God, and we want to practice and foster and develop the art of thankfulness. Tip number seven, when it comes to Christian contentment. Christian contentment is this word transcends. I'm going to explain quickly to you what this word transcends means. It transcends understanding and it transcends our current circumstances. The word transcendence means there's something more going on in this life than just what meets the eye. It's not just the physical reality around us. There's not just the physical existence. There is soul. There is eternity. There is spirit. There is something greater, and that is profound, and it's eternal, and it's transcendent, and we acknowledge that as Christians. Again, one of the things that the current atheist, secularist philosopher wrestles with is this issue of the good life and the promotion of self. Contentment, if it's found in yourself and not in the immediate world around them, they deny the transcendent. They say you can't turn to the transcendent because it doesn't exist. So you can't find contentment out there. You can only find it in here. But Paul says, bring your prayers and petitions to God in prayer and in peace and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will fill your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, it's a, it's a peace that surpasses understanding. It transcends understanding. Humanly speaking, the idea is in, in, without God, if things are going bad, your current circumstances, if they're bad, then I can't be content because my experience of this life is bad. Therefore, I, where can I find contentment? But the idea is that there's this peace that transcends sins understanding in a human sense it can't make sense except for god especially let me show you from philippians chapter 4 verse 11 for i've learned to be content whatever the circumstances i know what it is to be in need and i know what it is to have plenty i have learned the secret of being content in each and every situation friend again if you are a secular atheist alan de baton they're all french these philosophers he has a book called Status Anxiety, Anxiety About Status, Philosopher of Our Age. This is what he points out about contentment, and it's a kind of an acknowledgement that they're missing something huge, the secular philosophers. And here's the issue, and this is where I think our society as a whole is going really hardly wrong, and it's because if your contentment is only found within, if there is no transcendent, if there is no God then the source of your anxiety and the source of you not being content, well, that's your own fault. You're guilty now and you feel the extra guilt because it's on you to find that contentment and the contentment's got to be found somewhere from within. And so if you can't find the contentment, then you're, well, we can't say you're broken, but what we can say is it's your fault. And all that does is it makes that person get more crushed and more crushed and they feel guilty now because they can't find this elusive contentment. The, the, the weakness of this view is that salvation comes from within. But we know as Christians that salvation doesn't come from within, it comes from without. And the salvation comes from our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. With a secular atheist view, no one is coming to save you. You are on your own and you are drowning at sea. And our current generation, they get it. And that's why there's such a high level of mental health crisis. It's sort of like karma, according to that side. But friends, we don't have karma, we have grace. We have the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if you're listening to me right now, perhaps you are feeling this burden. And it's either whether you've been looking for that contentment from within 
And you're saying, where is it? Where is it? And now I feel guilty about it. Listen to the wonderful words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my burden is light and my yoke is easy. Friends, it's a wonderful source of contentment that in the midst of our discontentment, in the midst of our anxiety, we acknowledge that that salvation doesn't necessarily come from within, but it comes from God himself and his one and only son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian contentment will guard your hearts and minds. Again, this idea of guarding your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The good news indeed of Jesus Christ is we have a wonderful refuge and a high tower. It's a source of strength and comfort in our time of need. Jesus spoke about where you put your treasure, your heart is. And in Christ Jesus, we have this wonderful refuge or this guard. This idea is that whatever else you put your contentment in or your hopes or your treasure in, those things are fleeting. And COVID, if nothing else, has shown us how fleeting that contentment can be. But when it's in our Lord Jesus Christ, especially in his death and his resurrection three days later, we see the wonderful power and authority and the wonderful goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tip number eight, that this Christian contentment will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's where our source of contentment lies in, Jesus Christ, not in our sort of current circumstances and so forth. Tip number nine, and these last two will be very quick. It's an interesting place where our author takes us. Christian contentment is the practice of focusing. So again, in the passage, finally, verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. See, what Paul's saying is focus is the art of contentment. In the midst of all the bad things that are going on, focus and focus on those things that are true. Is this thing true? Is it noble? Is it good? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Put your your focus on those things and see in the ways in which that will help you in this area of anxiety and contentment. Again, it connects to that issue of quiet and what you're taking in. And again, friends, this is a particular challenge to a lot of men and the social media and the pornography. And the issue, again, is, is that the focus is good, is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it right? Is that where our focus is? Or is our focus on those things which are good and pure and praiseworthy? Where do you put your focus and where do you put your energy? It's interesting that psychologists and counsellors often talk about the language of self-talk. What are you saying to yourself in your head when you get up in the morning? And what are you saying to yourself when you look in the mirror? Again, there's a lot of this idea. The psychologists are picking up on this and they think they're discovering something like, Ooh, no one else has thought of this. And then you go, well, the Bible's been talking about it for a couple of thousand years. Focus on the good, on the praiseworthy is tip number nine. And the final tip, just to finish our time together, is tip number 10, Christian contentment and the irrepressible joy of the Lord. Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice The Old Testament prophet writes, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The great unshakable I am. How we're able to speak of rejoicing in God always, no matter what the circumstances that we face this week, that we can lay claim or hold to a peace that surpasses understanding as our hearts and minds are guarded for eternity in the hands of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. I want to finish just today by encouraging you just to consider those 10 tips. And as you think about those 10 tips, which of these might you kind of focus on, do you think? Or out of those 10, that's a lot to take in. Perhaps this week you just focus on one of those things. It's rare. It's elusive. But it's something that can be learned. It takes calming yourself and and some quiet. Maybe it means not looking at social media so much this week. It's about drawing near to God and God will draw near to you. The best way to do that, friends, is through the Bible. You can kind of see the qualities of God in creation at the beach. It's beautiful. But the best way to draw near to God is through his word and his revelation there. 
You can pray. Is it prayerfulness this week? Just bring your burdens to God. Is it this issue of thankfulness? Every day I'm going to say something that I'm thankful for if I'm in the midst of depression. And it will transcend that, that's, that idea. I'm not going to look it within. I'm going to look to God and ask for that help that I need. Because in Christ, he guards our hearts and minds. Where are we focusing our time and our energy? Seriously, one of the life-changing things that happened to me about a year or two ago, I went to the men's Rosetta group and there's a thing on your phone and it tells you how many hours a day you look at your phone. And it's terrifying. And it changes what you're doing. It changed what I was doing. Where's your focus? And again, finally, Lord, just rejoice. That, that the joy that comes from knowing that you are saved and loved by God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is from without. Man in history came to earth from God to show us that God exists and that he cares and that wonderful promise of salvation for eternity and not just new life, but eternal life forever with God. Let me pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do so thank you just for your word to us that it speaks of this life and this existence that it doesn't brush these things under the carpet. But, Lord, we do struggle with contentment. The media and the world around us keeps telling us that we're not good enough, that we need something more, that we're somehow lacking. But, Lord, we thank you for the grace and love that we find in Jesus Christ, that we learn that as we come to Jesus that you love us, that you accept us with all of our warts and faults and sins and, and failings. Lord, that you still will draw near to us, that when we draw near to you, we get this beautiful compassionate hug, like a father, the prodigal son, that we don't get the backhand, Lord, we don't get the aggression, we don't get the violence, Lord, we, we find love, we find forgiveness, we find mercy. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that wonderful peace that comes from knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray for those of us this week that are perhaps struggling with this area of contentment, that are searching and searching but have not found. Lord, we pray and ask that you would help answer this search, that as we look to you, that we would indeed find this wonderful peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
awestruck wonder.